Okay. Do you hear me? Hi. Uh, so I'm uh, Ron Pressler. I'm a programmer at Oracle, uh, where I work on the JVM. Uh, now let's get started. So in recent years, it seems to me that there's been an interest among uh, computing practitioners in the relationship among uh, computation, logic, and abstract algebra, in no small part due to the growing visibility of functional programming. As part of this trend, I've seen several descriptions of this relationship as something mysterious, magical, or fundamental. I even saw it described in religious terms, like computational Trinitarianism. I thought that this description uh, mystifies much more than clarifies, so I set out to learn the origin of these fields and ended up compiling uh, quite a long book, about 300 pages, composed almost entirely from a selection of primary sources. And uh, you can read the book online here. Um, I'm going to commit two crimes against history, or the practice of historical research. The first is the telling of history from the perspective of today, how the past brought about the present, rather, rather than from the perspective of the time. The second is that of simplification, due to time constraints and telling a narrative, and you should be suspicious of simple Gladwellian narratives. Um, the themes you're going to want to pay attention to are language, mind, and meaning. So, in the 4th century BC, Aristotle introduced his system of logical reasoning for the purpose of demonstration or rhetorical persuasion. It contained only primitive propositions, negation, inclusion or implication, and quantification, basic quantification, uh, kind of uh, monadic, uh, monadic logic today. Later in antiquity and the Middle Ages, uh, the connectives of uh, conjunction and disjunction were added, and an or. And I've seen uh, people claim that Aristotle intentionally left them out. And the result was a compositional language of logic. Aristotle's main contribution was the introduction of the logical form, hence the name formal logic. The form and the assumptions alone determine the truth. No use is made of intuition or any kind of reasoning that is not a man manipulation of the syntactic form by a given set of rules uh, that the Greeks and the schoolmen of the Middle Ages called syllogisms. But Aristotle's system of logic, which was a rhetorical device, was to be adapted to a very different use in the 17th century, the time of the scientific revolution. The relevant context and the direct inspiration for this new use is given by the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who wrote, nature is by the art of man imitated, that it can make an artificial animal, for seeing life is but a motion of limbs. Why, we, why may we not say that all automata, engines that move themselves by springs and wheels and as doth a watch, have an artificial life? For what is the heart but a spring, and the nerves but so many strings, and the joints but so many wheels, giving motion to the whole body, such as was intended by the artificer? Um, he also wrote, by ratiocination, so reasoning, I mean computation. Now, to compute, uh, this is the original, right? It's not translated, it's wrote in English. Now, to compute is either to collect the sum of many things that are added together, or to know what remains when one thing is taken out of another. Ratiocination, therefore, is the same with addition and subtraction. We must not, therefore, think that computation has place only in numbers, for magnitude, body, motion, time, degrees of quality, action, conception, proportion, speech and names in which all the kinds of philosophy consist are capable of addition and subtraction. Hobbes's words had a profound influence on uh, one of the main protagonists of this talk, the German polymath Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. The first step of Leibniz's argument is that the mind is an automaton and thinking is computation. Moreover, this computation is capable of mimicking precisely or discussing physical reality. Perhaps today we would say, would say uh, simulating. The second component to Leibniz's theory and uh, probably the most important one, is that language serves a central role in thought, and that often thinking is done mechanically by the mechanical manipulation of language terms. Our thoughts are for the most part what I call blind thoughts. I mean that they are empty of perception, sensibility, and consist in the wholly unaided use of symbols. Usually, words are in this respect like the symbols of arithmetic and algebra. 
We often reason in words with the object itself virtually absent from our mind. Language serves also for purposes other than communication, for it also enables man to reason to himself, both because words provide the means for remembering abstract thoughts, and also because symbols and blind thoughts are useful in reasoning, as it would take too long to lay everything out and always replace terms by definitions. So Leibniz reduced thought, or at least much of it, blind thought, what you said was much of thinking, to symbolic computation. Here, uh, Leibniz contrasts calculation, employing a pen and paper, with meditation that can be done entirely in the mind, even by a, a cuffed prisoner, and involves the direct manipulation of concepts unmediated by, by symbols and symbolic language. Uh, we'll later see Turing's treatment of this same situation. So, minds an automaton, and thinking is computation. Language expresses and aids thought. Thinking through language is a manipulation of symbols. And Leibniz envisioned a philosophical language, the characteristica universalis, that would formally express every scientific, mathematical, or philosophical thought. That language would have a mechanism, the calculus ratiocinator, that will allow to compute proofs to statements in the language. And what better way is there to manipulate the Aristotelian forms combining variables than the science of symbols, which is algebra? But it would have to be generalized beyond mere quantity. So the structure of Leibniz's language is modeled after that of algebra or arithmetic, but its goal is to allow us to compute things beyond mere numbers. Leibniz equates the notion of computation with the notion of proof. And uh, the two will be inseparable from that point on. Formal logical proof is just a calculation that is not necessarily arithmetical. Leibniz wanted to create an alphabet of thought through a general form of composition. The terms correspond to concepts, which are classes or sets of things. So, for example, metal could be thought of as a set of all metallic things. And then um, uh, they would be combined. So he had this list of axioms. Uh, the most interesting of which is the last, saying that the repetition of a term doesn't matter. So if you say uh, metallic, uh, all metallic metal, it's just the same as just saying metal. Uh, so AA is the same as A. Um, and the way this would work, this algebra would work, is that uh, every primitive term would have a number assigned to it. So we're going to encode everything by numbers. And uh, composition, which uh, in this case would be, would be intersection, uh, would be simple multiplication of the numbers. And then to know if one thing is made of another, we see if it's uh, divisible. Uh, I'll show an example in a second. But even though uh, Leibniz had intended to use algebra to represent things other than quantities, he still wouldn't conceive of a truly abstract algebra. Um, and so the operations still operate on numbers. Uh, but his plan was to encode any concept, even non-numerical, uh, especially a class or a set, as a number and then compose them. So um, his system uh, was this. So the uh, more general terms uh, are at the top. So let's say metal would get the number two and uh, yellow would get the number three. So gold would be six because it's yellow metal. And to know whether gold is a metal, we just see whether six is divisible by two and it is. Now actually multiplication wouldn't have worked with his axiom that repetition doesn't matter. Uh, so you would need to replace it with a uh, uh, lowest common multiple. Uh, lowest common multiple. I couldn't find that he actually did that, uh, but he came this close to coming up with a Boolean lattice uh, and Boolean algebra. Um, he even recognized that the logic was, was dual and that the encoding could be inverted. Uh, in fact, it says that some would prefer to, um, to uh, uh, encode the individuals of sets, and this way, the composition by multiplication uh, would be a union. Um, but, uh, so, and, and everything would just be inverted. Uh, but fans of uh, category theory uh, may be happy to see that he was not a fan of representing individual members of sets. Uh, he didn't want to rely on individuals. So once the characteristic numbers for most concepts have been set up, the human race will have a new kind of instrument, which will increase the power of the mind much more than optical lenses strengthen the eyes and which will be as far superior to microscopes or, or telescopes as reason is superior to science. Anyone who is certainly convinced of the truth of religion and its consequences and desires the conversion of mankind will surely admit that nothing will be more influential in this discovery for the propagation of faith. That was his goal. Uh, 
unless it be miracles, the holiness of an apostle, or the victories of a great monarch. But aside from that, computation is, is the best. When this is done, if controversies were to arise, there would be no more need for dis of disputation between two philosophers than between two calculators. For it would suffice for them to take their pencils in their, in their hands and to sit down at the abacus and say to each other, let us calculate, or calculemus. That is known as Leibniz's dictum, and shown here, men explaining all this to a bunch of, in most of the pictures, he's he shown explaining stuff to women. Uh, he even uh, built the stepped reckoner, the very first mechanical calculator that could perform all four arithmetical operations. But here we come to a surprising turn of events, uh, because while Leibniz's plan for the algebraization of logic uh, was known through his correspondences, and the, the general idea of the art of combination and uh, the lingua characteristica and the calculus ratiocinator, especially in the German-speaking world, he did not publish any of his work on the particular of the art of combinations, as he considered it unfinished. Instead, they lay hidden in the library of Hanover, uh, where he worked, for nearly 200 years. And their partial publication only began in the 1840s uh, or 30s. Uh, you can see, uh, and in the book, a lot of influences of the idea, uh, but much of it was lost until the 19th century. So in that period of the 19th century, mathematics achieved a religious status in Europe, and in the US. The discovery of the planet Neptune, precisely where calculation said it would be, caused a religious admiration of mathematics as a means to discover God. Uh, for example, in 1848, an American minister said in a sermon that mathematics consisted of those pure and incorruptible formulas which already were before the world was, that will be after it, governing throughout all time and space, being, as it were, an integral part of God. And much of the way to understand the mathematics of the 19th century is through religion. Um, in 1830, what we know today as abstract algebra was born in a book by George Peacock, Treatise on Algebra. Instead of variables representing numbers and the operations being defined on numbers, the operations would now be defined directly on symbols, and numbers would be just one interpretation. Uh, but the mathematical historian uh, John Michael Dubby claims that all of Peacock's treatment had actually been present in a series of unpublished manuscripts written in 1821 by Peacock's close friend and his co-founder uh, of uh, Cambridge's Analytical Society, Charles Babbage. Uh, in fact, Dubby says that Babbage's treatment uh, is superior, and we know for a fact that Peacock had read it because uh, they exchanged letters over it. Babbage was then the location professor of mathematics at Cambridge, so the same chair, the same professorship uh, as Isaac Newton before him. And he was uh, also possibly the best known mass, uh, mathematician, academic mathematician, who uh, spoke his mind on theological issues. But by the 1830s, Babbage was preoccupied by matters other than pure mathematics. Uh, he had designed one large scale calculation machine, the difference engine and was working in the design of a far more ambitious one, the analytical engine, that today we know would have been a general purpose computer. Um, the Irish science writer, Dionysius Lardner, wrote this uh, excited review. This application of an almost metaphysical system of abstract signs by which the motion of the hand performs the office of the mind. So see again that this implied relationship between thinking and writing that we saw in Leibniz and we're going to see again in Turing. And of course, uh, no one can do anything in computation or algebra or logic without uh, comparisons to Leibniz, so we compared uh, it to Leibniz's machine. Um, a few people, like Lardner and Ada Lovelace, saw the immense potential of computing machines, uh, but others did not. Uh, and to be fair, the uh, technological challenges may have been insurmountable uh, under the constraints of the time. Uh, but I put this slide up uh, because I think it has a lot to do with uh, this particular conference of bringing together uh, academia and uh, industry. He says, um, we trust that a more auspicious spirit is at hand, that the chasm which has separated practical from scientific men will speedily close, and that the combination of knowledge will be effected, which can only be obtained when we see the men of science more frequently extending their observant eye over the wonders of our factories and our great practical manufacturers with the reciprocal ambition presenting themselves as active and useful members of our scientific associations. Babbage, 
made some uh, actually very deep observations about universal computations. Um, for example, he realized that he would need some infinite resource uh, but to build a finite machine. Uh, so he said it is this substitution of the infinity of time for the infinity of space, which I've made use of, to limit the size of the engine and yet to retain its unlimited power. But note that uh, it lacks any rigorous analysis. It says thus it appears that the whole of the condition which enable a finite machine to make calculations of unlimited extent are fulfilled in the analytical engine. So he was right, uh, but he uh, wasn't able to, to present exactly why that is. Moreover, uh, he tends to mix these profound observations with amusing trivialities that makes assessing his contribution difficult. So uh, I soon arrived at a demonstration that every game of skill is susceptible of being played by an automaton, and he wanted to make a presentation to acquire funding. Uh, it occurred to me, then he chose uh, tic-tac-toe. Uh, he can't play chess, but I guess uh, he wanted to keep his size low. Uh, it occurred to me that if an automaton were made to play this game, it might be surrounded by, with such attractive circumstances that a very popular and profitable exhibition might be produced. I imagined that the machine might consist of the figures of two children playing against each other, accompanied by a lamb and a cock. That the child who won the game might clap his hands whilst the, whilst the cock was crowing, after which that the child who was beaten might cry and wring his hands whilst the lamb began bleating. So this is in the same discussion of universal computation. But uh, perhaps the biggest breakthrough uh, in logic in the 19th century, and some like uh, um, Bertrand Russell would say that one of the biggest breakthroughs in all time in mathematics, were two texts published uh, by George Boole, uh, a self-taught mathematician who wanted to become a minister, uh, in 1847 and 1854. Now, see how closely uh, Boole's reasoning follows that of Leibniz, even though he did, and this is important, he did not know of Leibniz at the time. Uh, in fact, the two are so close that even when compiling books, it's sometimes hard to tell which, which of them is which. So first we have the existence in, from, in our minds of general notions that are classes of individuals. Uh, and then it is connected to that of language. Those classes are represented by terms. And finally, the mental operations are symbolically expressed by manipulating language. He says it more explicitly here. The design of the following treatise is to investigate the fundamental laws of those operations of the mind, right? So logic is the investigation of the mind by which reasoning is performed, to give expression to them in the symbolical language of a calculus, and upon this foundation to establish a science of logic and, and construct its method. To deduce the laws of the symbols of logic from a consideration of those operations of the mind, which are implied in the strict use of language as an instrument of reasoning. So uh, he introduces syntax uh, containing, uh, consisting of variables, uh, operations taking directly from those of arithmetic, and identity. Um, and he was already familiar with that new idea of abstract algebra, and so his variables could represent concepts or classes, really sets today, directly without encoding them uh, as numbers as Leibniz had done. And I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it is believed that uh, Boole's algebra was the first uh, useful uh, abstract algebra. Um, for Boole, an important aspect of his logic was uh, its connection with religion. He belonged to a Christian faction that advocated a monistic view of the one and only God in contrast to the established Trinitarianism. This stance was reflected in his logic by his choice of the symbol one to represent the entire universe of discourse. He writes a lot how one is God and one is everything, so he chose the number one. There are other reasons, but this certainly played a role, he says so explicitly. Um, and he wrote a poem. He wrote actually quite a few. Uh, he wasn't bad. Uh, but this was a particularly good one, uh, one of the, his daughter's favorites, called to the number three, uh, which tries to explain why it is that people are psychologically drawn to Trinitarianism, even though it is false. And it is uh, uh, from that poem that the title of the book and this talk is taken. So these are the key elements. You have one represents everything, the universe of discourse, zero is the empty set. Uh, multiplication is the mental operation of selecting something out of another, uh, which is intersection, but he describes it in mental terms. Plus is a union of disjoint sets. So X plus Y is only defined if their intersection is empty. Um, what's known as Boole's equation was that for any X, X squared is equal to X. The repetition of terms doesn't matter, the same as we saw in Leibniz. 
um, which is, I think, the law of explosion. Uh, it's uh, equivalent to that in the Boolean algebra. And um, this is how you'd write in Boolean algebra, all x is y, x, y is equal to x. Uh, this is how you'd write some x is y, say x, y is equal to v. For some reason, you didn't write x, y is different from zero. x, y is equal to v, where it's understood that v is not zero. All right, so Boole's insistence on plus or disjunction being a partial operation defined only on disjoint classes was very controversial. He had very good reasons to do that uh, because he wanted to make the algebra much more similar to the ordinary algebra and numbers. And there was a long debate with uh, another logician, Stanley Jevons, about this, a debate that Boole ultimately lost. Uh, also, Jevons uh, used the infinity sign instead of one uh, for the top element for everything. Uh, and so uh, people got together and designed a more convenient algebra uh, that was designed with disjunction as ordinary union uh, and where conjunction and disjunction were duals. And this image is from a seminal paper in abstract algebra by the American uh, philosopher, pragmatist philosopher and logician Charles Sanders Pierce, and it shows a duality. Uh, this is basically, f so uh, this sign is uh, either implication or set inclusion or less than or equal to. They're all the same. And this is a definition, by the way, of the universal construction of product to co-product in category theory. Uh, it's, it's that. Um, and uh, it was Pierce and a German logician by the name of Ernest Schrader that invented lattice theory from uh, Boole's logic, showing that implication was actually an order relation, something that uh, Leibniz may have recognized. And it was logicians like Boole, Pierce, and Schrader, uh, and well, Babbage was something a bit different, but who invented abstract algebra. And they modeled it to fit after several a series of tweaks with the system of Ari Aristotelian logic. It was designed to fit with Aristotelian logic, uh, the logic of composition, and later was unified with other ideas from number theory. And so abstract algebra we have today really comes from uh, logic and number theory. Um, but a most fascina fascinating aspect of that very seminal paper, that very paper on abstract algebra by Pierce, is how he explains how the algebraic, algebraic rules arise. So he too, like Leibniz and Boole, ties it to the workings of the mind. But interestingly, he doesn't go through the mediation of language, but directly through the theory of nervous action that was new at the time, and from what little I know, the way he, the way he discusses it, it, it is largely wrong or, or very inaccurate. But he says that the, basically the laws of combination, laws of composition have a source not in the language, but in the neurons. Um, that's, that was not how they were called then, but... Now, what about computing machines? So the 19th century logicians built and designed a lot of computation machines, logic machines. Uh, the one on the left and the blueprint in the background is Jevon's piano. Uh, could do some uh, calculations in uh, propositional calculus. Uh, this is a machine designed by John Venn, kind of reluctantly because uh, he was very skeptical of logic machines. Uh, there was even an electrical machine built in 1890 uh, by Ellen Markand, uh, but it's suspected that it was uh, Pierce who actually designed it. Now, what about Leibniz? So his writings on formal logic started being uncovered in the 1840s, and Boole's wife, who was a, a mathematician in, in her own right, Right, some men wrote to my husband to say that in reading an old treatise by Leibniz, he had come upon the same formula which the Cambridge people call Boole's equation. That's what we saw, A, A is A. My husband looked up Leibniz and found his equation there and was perfectly delighted. He felt as if Leibniz had come and shaken his hands with him across the centuries. Afterwards, one of my husband's admirers and would-be followers tried to persuade me that Leibniz did not understand as much or mean as much as Boole had done. Um, but the full extent of Leibniz's contribution only became gradually known. And the first uh, book about Leibniz's formal logic was published uh, only in 1900 by a young philosopher named Bertrand Russell. So that same year, at a philosophy conference in Paris, uh, Russell met Giuseppe Piano, uh, who invented uh, a very useful notation for writing formal mathematical statements, more or less the one we use to this day. And uh, thanks to Piano, uh, was introduced to the writings of a German philosopher called Gottlob Frege. So that, that, that was a meeting that changed, he writes, that, that changed his life. So Frege's Begriffsschrift, his ideography, 
which was his very first foray into formal logic, is considered by many to be the birth of modern formal logic. So, like Leibniz and Boole, note the centrality of language. Uh, his motivation, I found the inadequacy of language to be an obstacle. This is why he started on this. This deficiency led me to the idea of the present ideography. Um, Frege saw himself as starting to fulfill Leibniz's vision of a characteristic universalis and calculus ratiocinator. Uh, but he says, uh, his idea, he's talking about Leibniz, uh, his idea of a universal characteristic, uh, calculus philosophicus ratiocinator, was so gigantic that the attempt to realize it could not go beyond the bare preliminaries. The enthusiasm that sees its originator when, when he contemplated the immense increase in the intellectual power of mankind, that a system of notation directly appropriate to objects themselves would bring about, led him to underestimate the difficulties that stand in the way of such an enterprise. So he decided to start uh, um, realizing Leibniz's vision uh, uh, piecewise, piecewise. So uh, this was uh, Frege's formal notation. Uh, we still use the same abstract syntax, but obviously not this syntax. Uh, and it marked a sharp departure from the algebraic school begun with George Boole. So instead of equations and reasoning by substitution and elimination, formal reasoning uh, proceeds by syntactic inference rules more elaborate than those offered by algebra, or at least the algebra at the time, because it had quantification. Uh, and uh, Frege's work was not received kindly by the algebraic school. Uh, and an interesting debate broke over whether he had created a lingua characteristica or mere calculus ratiocinator. So, uh, Schrader claimed the latter. He says, uh, Frege's title promises too much. Instead of leaning towards the universal characteristics, the present work definitely leans toward Leibniz's calculus ratiocinator. And uh, Frege insisted the opposite. He says, I know that my approach was different from Boole. I was not trying to present an abstract logic and formula. I was trying to express contents in an exacter, more perspicuous manner. Uh, I was trying, in fact, to create a lingua characteristica in the Leibnizian sense, not a mere calculus ratiocinator. Now, Schrader said that, um, that uh, Leibniz's logic is redundant because he, you can translate everything from Boolean algebra and back, uh, so the two are equivalent, you have two different views, uh, but uh, to that, Frege said that of course they are. Uh, if the same subject matter can be presented in two systems of symbols, it follows automatically translation or transcription from one to the other is possible. So both Boolean algebra and Frege's formal logic were just uh, dealing with the same subject matter of Aristotelian logic, the growth and coding. Uh, but that doesn't mean that his notation wasn't better. Um, Frege was especially interested in analyzing the precise relationship between language and meaning. This is another important point. So, here, the important point is, um, at the top, no one will expect any sense to emerge from empty symbols. So meaning precedes language. First, like Boole wrote, and like Leibniz, first we form concepts in our mind, classes, and then we assign them to uh, terms. Uh, in another uh, famous paper uh, on sense and reference or denotation, he identifies two different kinds of meanings in a language that today in programming language theory, uh, we call them operational denotational semantics. Um, Russell's elaboration in Frege's work, together with Alfred North Whitehead, uh, was very successful and made Frege's system of logic the dominant one. So dominant that the algebraic tradition in logic was largely abandoned for a very long time. And so after about 250 years, where computation logic and algebra were considered by everyone to be the same thing, uh, this was the first break, the one between logic and algebra. And algebra. As Frege noted, it was still the same subject matter so the working of the mind, but really just Aristotelian logic. But for the first time, we had two different perspectives on it. So now on to computation. Um, the next part of the story is rather famous among computer scientists. And if you don't know it, I'll refer you to the book. Uh, and I've even uh, told it in my talk at Corian two years ago. So I'm not going to repeat it, just to summarize. Uh, the work of Russell and Whitehead started a period of great excitement. Uh, so much so that David Hilbert, the most uh, prominent mathematician at the time, was struck with uh, Leibnizian optimism and believed that all mathematics could be carried out by formal computation. And perhaps even more famously, that hope was crushed by Kurt Gödel, who in 1931 uh, proved that in any formal system rich enough to describe mathematics, there are statements that can be neither proved nor disproved. Uh, and at that point, 
it became clear to everyone that the question of whether it was possible to mechanically classify formal mathematical statements uh, to be either true, false, or after good, unanswerable, would almost certainly be answered in the negative. So they knew they were going to get a negative answer, but a proof of that rested on a precise definition of what a mechanical process or an algorithm is. So that's what all of Jason started working on, and that was a big question in the 1930s. Sorry, your slides don't seem to be changing. No, no it's fine. <laughs> just, just listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so in 1936, now it's In 1936, uh, Alonzo Church, uh, a logician in Princeton, published a paper where he uses a formal system of his own invention and that of his students, uh, the lambda calculus, to demonstrate how if we were to define a mechanical calculation to be what's expressible in his language, then some questions are indeed beyond the decision power of such a system. Uh, the advantage of his language was that it took all the pre So before, when everyone talked about computation, they used uh, um, uh, the predicate calculus. So uh, he took uh, all, the, all the, the previous formal languages that were the people used to discuss both logic and computation and greatly simplify them to something that is very basic and feels almost fundamental. That, that was uh, his intent. That, that's what he, he writes. Uh, but there was a hole in his reasoning and one that required him to make uh, a circular argument and he noted that and in a footnote he wrote, if this interpretation or some similar one is not allowed, it is difficult to see how the notion of an algorithm can be given any exact meaning at all. So he, he stumbled on some circularity and then he says, well, if I can't do this, then no one can. Um, and Gödel indeed did not find Church's definition satisfactory. Uh, the problem lies with the very reliance on a formal language with an arbitrary set of axioms as a definition of computation. So while it is true that some statements expressible in Church's language could not be mechanically resolved, uh, so it ostensibly it proved that some propositions cannot be mechanically decided, uh, he gives no justification for not introducing an axiom that simply declares those propositions resolvable. So for example, we could introduce a constant lambda term, it's called H, uh, that axiomatically reduces to true or false given such decision problem, uh, as long as the question does not contain H itself. So of course, even, even if we add this constant, um, then there are some questions that would be unanswerable this time that do contain H, and we can add another axiom, uh, another constant axiomatically. Uh, but there is no justification for saying this is computation uh, and adding that additional axiom is not. Like, what is the difference? Um, and like all other formal languages before, before him that trying to discuss computation, Church's was ultimately arbitrary. And we can try to explain why such a problem necessarily arose given that Church was still operating in that same Leibnizian, Boolean, Frigean notion of thought where meaning precedes language, then we have computation. If concepts precede language, and that precedes computation, then why can we not add to our language a term for the concept, that which cannot be computed, or that which cannot be computed without this term? Uh, so this is one of the things that, that bothered uh, Gödel. He said, there's no way to say where, where this language has to stop. Um, why is that computation not with an addition of another axiom? Uh, but working uh, concurrently to Church was the young Alan Turing, uh, who as an undergraduate at Cambridge had been exposed to formal logic and good result, and decided to get to the bottom of the notion of computation. He was the first to break away from almost 300 years of Leibnizian tradition, and possibly from 2,000 years of Aristotelian tradition. Uh, his friend and only student, uh, Robin Gandhi, wrote about him, it is almost true to say that Turing succeeded in his analysis because he was not familiar with the work of others. He said, uh, he, called him, uh, 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 he said he had an uncluttered mind. Turing pretty much turned that picture in his head, on its head. Computation is a primitive concept. And unlike Frege's claim that meaning cannot arise from empty symbols, meaning can and does arise from empty symbols. Computation and thought do not depend on a combinatory language that dates all the way back to, to Aristotle. The words language or formal system actually appear nowhere in Turing's paper, except when he explains how other formal systems are indeed mechanical in the literal sense, and famously he proves uh, the equivalence of formal proofs, he uses the predicate calculus with computation. He shows the Turing machines are equivalent to proofs. Uh, in fact, he was even very careful not to use any logical axiom of any kind. The, it was 
beautifully intentional and, and the familiar proof of the halting theorem that, that uh, all of us or many of us have learned uh, is actually due to Martin Davis, the one based on contradiction. And Turing quickly writes that the theorem is actually easy to prove by contradiction, but he's not going to do that because it's going to be unsatisfying. And he gives a different one that doesn't rely on any logical axiom, uh, just on what can be called common sense. So um, yeah, you can read it while I'm speaking. Uh, like Leibniz and, and Boole and Pierce and Frege, Turing wanted to analyze how we think. And like Leibniz, uh, Turing gives a model where the computer, uh, a person, has some states of mind as well as access to pen and paper. But Turing explains how the mind works without an appeal to language, like Leibniz or Boole, or to a specific and wrong or inaccurate biological process like Pierce. Instead, he appeals only to necessity based on common sense and a most abstract yet razor sharp analysis of computation. Turing uh, did not know about Babbage's work. He only learned about it in 1940. Uh, but his treatment of computation is rigorous, unlike Babbage's. And it's absolutely crucial to point out that Turing, unlike Church, does not merely introduce another model. He introduces all of them at once because he, just, he enumerates the primitive operations that a computation can do. Later, for the purpose of a mathematical proof, he, he settles on a particular model, uh, his automatic machine that Church uh, later uh, named the Turing machine. Uh, but his construction of it is explicitly arbitrary, uh, given those uh, limitations of what can be done by a machine. Uh, and it is clear that it would work for any machine, not just for his particular machine. And this is uh, Turing's analysis of meditation versus calculation. Unlike Leibniz, he shows that meditation can be reduced to computation very beautifully by noting that you can write down the state of mind on a note. And if you leave your work and come back and read the note, and if it has enough information, if not, you can add to it, uh, meditation can be uh, computation. Uh, Gödel called Turing's analysis a miracle. Um, and more than just analyzing which operations can be carried out, um, he says that previously you could, something could only uh, define relative to a given language. For each individual language, clear. The one that's obtained is not the one looked for. Um, but this is different. It is not necessary to distinguish orders. Those orders are what he said about adding. So you can have like lambda calculus without this H, with one H, with two H, etc. Uh, because here, uh, it, it cleanly escapes that circularity that plagued uh, Church's proof. Because if some questions cannot be answered by a machine, and we define what it is that a machine can do, we can't axiomatically define a machine that can solve those problems because that machine would necessarily be, must be able to do things not listed in the things that a machine can do, and so cannot be a machine. Um, so Turing's analysis of computation was the second bifurcation in the study of thought, separating computation from logic by establishing it as the more primitive notion. Uh, but this break was far more important than the first between logic and algebra because this one is not just a matter of representation, uh, but it demonstrates that a computation fundamentally precedes language and meaning, and that a formal language can be defined in terms of this more uh, primitive concept. In fact, that's what Gödel says. It. Now, after Turing, we know what a formal language is. Um, in addition, it shows that computation can be carried out in systems very different from the compositional Aristotelian framework. Indeed, not only can, but thanks to Turing's later work on biology uh, uh, neural networks, We've come to see computation as an abstraction of natural phenomena and realize that actually most computation around us is carried out in a way that is very different from that old particular compositional framework. That's it. Less of a question and, and more of a comment. Uh, this is really meaty. I'm, I'm really digging it. Uh, have you considered different ways of presenting the material? It's in, it's in a book you, that you can read online. Yes, but as for the presentation. Uh, no, but maybe I should. <laughs> okay, that, that's kind of it. Thanks a lot, though.
Yeah, uh, up here. Um, so you mentioned a number of characters in here that are both philosophers and mathematicians. It seems like there's a connection between the two fields that's not always expressed. Well, Can you the, say the say origin of, of as you say, the origin of notions of computation and logic and algebra started with logicians and logic is a field that is well part it strides both math mathematics and philosophy. I don't know how much both, maybe more philosophy, maybe more mathematics, but certainly. Uh, Many of the people who made the biggest contributions were philosophers. In fact, Turing is considered, if, if you read what philosophers write about Turing, they, they say the mathematical philosopher Alan Turing. It seems also that philosophy has a problem in defining its terms well. Why is that not better with mathematics added in the mix? But the, the Leibniz's original idea, and, and, and you see it in Frege too, they say precisely that they find natural language to be a limitation and they want to see something more precise. So they, Leibniz had thought of and Frege invented the, in Boole too, uh, a mathematical and precise language for the discussion of philosophy. Um, so it's just in a conference designed to bridge um, academia and, and practice, so it might be worth remembering that um, apparently Babbage made major contributions to machine tooling during the development of his, uh, his engines. I did not know that. It's yes. interesting. So he Babbage used, made some contributions to tooling. Because he used tolerances that hadn't been used before, and he had to force his, push his mechanics a lot further than the, was, was traditional. Thank so you. There's a, there's a book on, on the development of the, uh, the, the engines, the Babbage engines. Thank you. So uh, there's a rather final quote there at 1964. Are there any indications that there are steps beyond this, or is this it? Do, do we see the light here? What light? I, I don't think I don't think we've seen God. Like that's what Leibniz uh, wanted, right? Well, so it hasn't proved the existence of God. This final quote seems very final. You know, it's the the adequate definition is there. Yeah, well, there are still many questions that we want to know about, you know, formal systems and computation and. And we have your, you know, two different branches in, in theoretical computer science. Uh, but that's uh, more about application, com complexity. There, right? No, there's complexity theory that directly stems from Turing's work, and there's um, the theory B, the uh, let's call it programming language theory that still studies uh, the design of um, of formal systems. That that we now know what a formal system is. I mean, we know that formal is mechanical and can be performed by a machine. That we know. So we have the basics. Okay. So it's the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> A quick point of clarification, uh, something I didn't grok was I thought that um, Grodel showed that uh, with Bertrand Russell's uh, work that um, if you add another axiom, it doesn't solve the foundational problems of that he because there was always out. there there would always be more things that more questions that cannot be answered more. yeah so then what do you mean by the the church's issue with circular oh, logic so it's the same so Gödel pointed out the same thing he said but Gödel said it first yeah and then about different matters so okay. actually actually one of the interesting things is I saw that uh, one of the things I read by Robin, G Robin Gandhi, a uh, Turing student, wrote a beautiful paper, uh, historical paper, The Confluence of Ideas in 1936. He maps exactly who knew what in 1936. And he says that, to, in his mind, the bigger question was not why it was uh, Church and Turing that finally uh, got to the, the Entscheidungsproblem, the decision problem, but why was it that uh, Gödel and von Neumann did not? Um, and he's, he, he tries to explain why they didn't. But, so it's a similar problem, that of diagonalization, that uh, something cannot be achieved with this language, uh, but then you can add something to it to fill that hole, but then there's another. Uh, it's just that you don't know where, where to stop. Uh, so it's the same idea, but applied to church as well. 
Uh, I just thought it was interesting. You, you, you sort of spoke of bifurcations here, um, but uh, it, it seems to me that there are also sort of uh, coming together in, in, in the modern uh, era or after this point, particularly uh, things uh, along the lines of, of uh, algebraic automata theory. Uh, I, I wonder if you feel that these bifurcations are unbridgeable uh, no. Uh, it, it was just, uh, I, I was trying to tell an origin story. Uh, uh, I, I think it's like, uh, part, of, part, of the, part of the story is like, uh, let's say a man who goes to some uh, foreign country and comes back and tells his, his children about it, and they tell their children and they tell their children, and after many generations, some of those descendants meet and they don't know they're related, and they forget the name of the country, but they remember the stories and they talk to each other, and they say, oh my god, we've recovered something fundamental about the nature of stories but really it was the same story by the same man in the same country. And I think this is a story here, but it does not mean that there is nothing fundamental about the nature of stories, nor that the changes over time are not, uh, uh, not contributed and can be used. So uh, I don't think they're, they're unbridgeable. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, it's fine.